your tears and your intercession. They have risen up as a sweet aroma, the prayers of the saints. And I've seen your hearts cry. And I listen. Do not be afraid of what is coming on the earth because things must happen as they are to happen. But when you spread my word, the gospel, amongst the people, and they pick up stones to stone you, walk in love toward them, walk through them, for I am your protector. I will prepare a table for you in front of your enemies and anoint your head with oil. Do not lay down the sword that I have given you, for I am the rock that sharpens that sword and keeps it sharp. The sword that is forged in the fire of my Holy Spirit. Do not lay down the sword, but pick it up every day and carry it with you. For it reveals the truth that is in me, saith the Lord, that I'm the Redeemer, the Savior of the world. Fear not what man can do unto you, but fear me, saith the Lord, and obey me, and I will keep you in perfect peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And have not I said unto you, that my grace is sufficient. Have not I said my grace is sufficient? At those times, at those times, come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for mercy and grace, and I will give it to you. At times when you cannot feel me, Know that I am there. Ask for my grace, for my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is all that you need. So I say unto you today, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and grace, and you will find it in your time of need. Yes, there are times, times of need in your life. And when those times are there, I say unto you to, again just to come boldly to the throne of grace. And there you will find my mercy and there you will find my grace. And it shall be what you need. It shall be sufficient for you. I tell you this. I tell you this, and this is a promise that I give to you today. A promise that as you come, I will give you that grace. That grace that's sufficient to meet every need that you have. Every need that you have. Yes, in the families. The message title is Statistics on Teenagers in American Today. Statistics on Teenagers in America Today. It's not pretty. But I think it's, we're fixing to start a new year. And you know, I've been praying for revival since 1988. And we're going to have revival. I just want to let you know that. Because we're along the coast. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love it to be this year. <laughs> oh, glory to God. It can be, yes, yes. And uh, and how would a revival change things here in our very own city? How would it if, if it happened? And it will happen. And uh, we all live down here in southwest Louisiana, and people in a revival, they wouldn't know how to handle a revival, but God knows how. And he'd bring people, and he'd bring help, just like he did in Florida. And uh, would it change the way you are? Would it change the way our families are? Would it change the way our neighbors and our people we work with? Yes. Look, it's an impact. I can, 
give you some stories about Brownsville. And we were, Annette had put some program on television yesterday afternoon, a worship program on some, last night on, I don't know, the God Channel. <gasps> they had a worship service. I have not, I have not been in a worship service like that since Brownsville, you know, since we we go to Brownsville every now and then. Oh, man. I mean, I'll tell you what. People in Brownsville would line up at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday to get in to the service or on Sunday evenings. The doors opened at 6 o'clock. And they'd line up at 7 in the morning. they start gathering at 7. Is that right? Sunday. On Sunday, I mean, yeah. That's on Sunday morning. No, on Saturdays. They had service on Saturday night, and they would line up at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, and uh, the ministry would uh, would give them, uh, you know, sandwiches or something like that. They'd have some little something for them for breakfast. They had to, and a little noon snack, and then they'd open the, the doors. I think it was 5 o'clock or 6. I think it was 5. They'd open up at 5. That's right. The big double balcony up there, you know, and everything. I mean, it was a single balcony, but I'm talking about it was another floor and open a balcony, and it was full. And I remember one lady, she um, she passed out. She she comes to the revival by herself, you see. Her husband wasn't there. And she came to the revival, she went up front, and she got slain in the spirit, and people were leaving, and they were leaving, and they were leaving, and she was still there, slain in the spirit. So they had to get... Uh, I don't know, four or five men to carry her to the lobby in the back. And then they had to, uh, they, you know, they, they found out who she was. And then uh, they called her husband. And uh, I don't know if the husband came to get her or he, or they called her, or, uh, a bunch of them brought her to her house. But this is the anointing of the Spirit of God. When it hits, folks, I'm going to tell you something. And I already told you this. I'm going to say it again. When he come. Uh, what was his name, the music guy? Lindell. Lindell Cooley would come. He'd go up to the keyboard, and he'd hit one one key. Like, it would, like, it was something like this. All right, let me just get it right over here. He'd walk up to the keyboard, and he'd hit one note. They had about maybe 30 people or so in, in the choir, all in their choir robes in the back, on, on the stage, and they had a keyboard, and he'd walk up there, and he did one key. Everybody was talking. Before the service started, before the service started, people would talk to you like you in a regular church. And th there was no coffee room like this, you know what I'm talking about? And so they'd, they were all in the church, and it was packed, and they're just talking. And then when he'd walk in, he'd press that one note. This one right here. And boy, it would quiet down. And almost within a few minutes, I would be under the pew, laying under the pew in the front of me. Isn't that right in it? I just, it just couldn't stand up. I just couldn't take it. The power of God was so much. It was just awesome. And uh, he said there's going to be revival, like I said before, along states in the Gulf Coast. So we're on the Gulf Coast, right? And it's going to come. Now, would it change our churches if we had revival? Yes. Would it change the teens in our schools? Would it change our friends? Would it change our families? Would it change you? Listen, and I saw that worship last night on the God Channel. Is that what it was? It just blew me away. It just... I have not seen that kind of movement of the Spirit uh, since the Brown Bill Revival. It just did something to me last night, and I just got all upset. I said, you know, we have to address that. But... Anywho, uh, 
in many a church today, many go really pompous and pious in the presence of everyone else. Music playing without any really convicting messages taking place. No talk about stealing. No talk about lying. No talk about adultery, fornication, pornography, cheating, homosexuality or lesbianism, stealing on income tax, those poor people who are caught on drugs. And, but what are they like outside the church? Let me tell you, when revival hits, there's going to be a big difference in the way people walk and talk. I want to know what kind of shout do they give and what kind of shout would they give when the rubber hits the road because their eyes and hearts are going to be opened and they will shout. I'll tell you, when revival hits, something happens on the inside. A lot of what churches are today is what they hear on the outside and the heart is it's not there in the heart. But look out when it's going to hit. I know. Man, what an awe. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's unbelievable. And many who leave churches today go back to a devil home. A lot of teenagers go back to a devil home. Many don't even know who their parents are. Some have to go back to devil wives. Some have to go back to devil husbands and devil kids. No solution seems to be at hand for the devil and his work and our relatives in many a case. But when revival hits, <laughs> the key is there. You can walk on the scene and when you walk on the scene, things change. Even when you walk into a store, people feel the presence and the anointing when you've been to some of these meetings. Some in churches today do not even live with their dads. Some have friends that do not even know which way is up, which way is down. You got to understand that the world is not getting better. It's getting worse. Worse. But I suggest to us all that we, it's time for us to wake up and smell the coffee because there's going to be revival because it's getting worse. Let me give you an idea of what's going on right now. In our schools, our schools have become a slaughter pen and a war zone. Our government is bent on killing babies. We are filled in America with government corruption, government financed murder. It's called abortion. Government financed murder. Racism. America's filled with gangs, drive by shootings. They just had one just last week in a, come some cities around Lafayette. Homosexuality, there's drug addiction, pornography, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. Now you know why we're praying for revival. You know why we need revival. That's going to change. Here you are with all the fine things of life. America, once known as America the Beautiful, while people out there are busting hell wide open. And I want to know something. What are we going to do about it? Do you realize a handful of people can change a country? Do you realize that when the lid's taken off, the glory of God, it blossoms? That's how it started. A handful would be like a church, maybe larger than ours, but started meeting in prayer. Look at Brownsville. I'm not through with Brownville because I think we're going to see another one. Say amen. amen. And I know what are we going to do about it. 48% of all births in America 
are from unwed mothers. 48% of all births in America are from unwed mothers. How many more? Look at now, you can do this. Take your daily advertiser. When, 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 when do they have the week? Births. Well, anyway, you look at it and you find out that it's in the 40% of those that are that are not married. Okay, you got it? They're not married. They're having births out of marriage. That's here in Lafayette. Now, how many teenagers are sexually active? Now, what is a teenager defined to be? A person who's what? A teen? 13 years old? Up to 19. Now, watch this. 30% of all high school students reported being sexually active. They had sex in the last previous three months. 30%. Under half, 46% of all 12th graders, students reported being sexually active compared to almost 15.7 of the ninth grade students. Ninth grade students, can you imagine that? Here's the condition of those splitting hell wide open, looking at the teens only. And what are we doing in our puppets on Sundays? What's going on in our puppets? There are over 30 million students that make up our youth culture. On any given year in the United States, 135,000 students, 135,000 students have taken guns to school in any single year. We had a young man that was caught in Lafayette at a school with a gun last week. You saw that on television. Local shooting. In 2013, every town began tracking gunfire in schools and at college and universities. They began doing that. They're doing it today. Public reports that a firearm was discharged inside a school building or on a school or campus grounds and over the next three years identified 160. They were identified 160 qualifying incidents, including fatal and non-fatal assaults, suicides, and unintentional shootings. In all of these incidents, it resulted in 59 deaths and 124 non-fatal gunshot injuries, which caused severe damages, hurt, harm. 4,000 students are killed or wounded in the ghettos, streets, from gunfire every single year. 4,000 students, I didn't say adults, I said 4,000 students in America are injured in a single year in the ghettos, like Chicago. It's horrible in Chicago. One third of the students in America claim to have stolen something last year. One third. Cheating on tests. I might have told you about. I had a. I was teaching this physics class, at U L, and they they had this football player, a big big guy, man. This guy's gigantic, sitting there, and he he wouldn't take notes. He just sit there. I said, this guy must be smart, man. He'd take up a chair and a half, but he. He sat in one chair. The chairs in in uh, one one uh, fourteen would they have you know what do you call it armrests on each one? You know they all locked together. You know I mean it's, they've been there since the thirties, I'm sure. And man, this guy would turn in his paper and he had like a a naughty on it. And man, I said, what in the world is this? This guy must be brilliant. So I gave out the next test when it came. And I'd watch him. He was always yawning. <laughs> and he'd go. <sighs> and he's always yawning. Always yawning. So I fixed him up. 
you know. I make out two tests every other row because you have 150 chairs in the room, so I have 135 students in the class. And you can hear a pin drop, you know what I'm talking about? And they can't bring their cell phones because they text each other to get the answers from across the room, you see? And so I give different tests. But they still manage even to cheat with different tests, you understand? I'm watching 150 kids, so man, I got this guy fixed up. I made him a totally different test. Same number of questions. And so when I give this guy, he's in the middle of the, you have 13 seats in, in, the, in the middle section, then you have a, an aisle, and then uh, I think it's seven, five or seven seats there and over here. So, man, I fixed him up good. So I gave him a, but you can't tell, it's different. The numbers are different. He's put in different places and everything else. So, man, he gets his test paper. And I leave it in my office. And when I get the test papers back, every student has a number. Same as my roll book. And so then every student has a number, and they have to put their number on their test with their name signed on the test, right? So, therefore, and I stack them in, in 10 when I give them out. 1 through 10, right here. You know, 2 through 20, right here. And so they come on up to the desk, and so they know where their, their line is when they get the test back, and they get the test back. And so if I call somebody cheating, you know, I don't get the test back. It's, I leave it in my office, and they come to me and say, Hey, uh, Dr. Lady, we, we, I didn't get my test. It wasn't in there. Oh, I said, don't worry about it. I said, look, follow me to my office after class, and I'll give test back at, at the beginning of the class. And I said, I'll, I'll get it for you. Okay. So he comes in, man. And I've already called the dean. I've already called the dean. Gave his name. Okay. And they know it when I tell them. So then, okay, can I have my, oh, yeah, sure, man. Uh, what's your name again? So he told me what his name. Oh, I said, let me see. I got it. Oh, here it is right here. I said, here it is. A zero? Well, yeah, you got a zero. You missed all the questions, you know. I said, you got your answers from the person on the side of you because I said, now, that person right there, if I take your paper, I said, you darken the same circles as your neighbor. And I said, this person did really good, you know. I put him next to a smart student, you know, an A student. I said, this, this person made a 90 something And I said, you made a zero. And I said, you want to tell me now what, what happened? I said, no. I said, be honest. I said, it's time to start telling the truth. I said, you've been stealing. It's, it's time to tell the truth. I said, I can forgive you. I've already called the dean. And I said, it's on your record. So I'm going to tell you, don't do it again. Because I said, I don't want you to get kicked out of school or something like that. And even in another class, it's on your record. So I said, don't do that again. I said, study, man. And so I had one girl that came in. And that's when H.L. Griffin, uh, I was in H.L. Griffin on the second floor in uh, 2017. The uh, physics room building was being remodeled. You know, the room itself was being remodeled. So I had to meet in this, and, and this was in the summertime, I had to meet in that room. So this beautiful girl, she's about 24, 25 years old, beautiful, walks in and she sits on the front row right here like there's big sections here on the front row right there. And she walks in 10 minutes late every day. Every time this class, five days a week, she walks in 10 minutes late. So then she take her test and everything. And so she, uh, the physics room was finally through. So then it's through, you see. I wouldn't suspect that she was cheating. I'm looking at the whole class. I never, you know. So then... We go back to the old room. I give the next test, and I put her on the front row like this. Either, I think it's five seats. I put her right there, okay? And I put another student about three seats over, right there. And so, man, so I look there. She's assigned a seat, and I look, and it's not her. It's not her. 
like so. I said, hmm. I'm not going to make a scene in the class. So I look around far and I don't see her. So I pick up the test papers and I grade them. And you know, she had a, a decent grade, this this little girl, I mean, on took took the test and she had a decent grade. I don't know if she cheated or what, but anyway. So then, w now, the girl in the middle of the class, in the middle of the, the test, says, look, uh, can, can I go to the bathroom? I said, oh, yeah, go ahead. So she goes to the bathroom, okay? And she has some, then she takes papers and puts them on the desk. Well, she's hiding her test, I think, you know, that's good. So then she comes back. Now, but it wasn't the girl that I, you know, assigned there. And I, I didn't see the girl that had been assigned there. So then I grade the papers and everything. And so what I do is uh, when it comes time and I knew it wasn't her and she wasn't there and her paper is signed with her signature, because I went and said, wait, I got a paper. So she's, her name is signed on the test paper. Well, what happened was she took her test with her, obviously, and she went to the restroom, the girl's waiting for in the restroom at midway in the test, and signs her name on the test paper. And she signs her name, the girl that was assigned there, and then the girl brings the test back, and now it has the person that's supposed to have taken the test, but it's a joke, you see, a lie. So then, man, so the girl comes to me, she said, look, my paper's not in, in the thing. Oh, I said, see me after class. I said, I'll, I'll give it to you. So, so same scenario, so I called the dean, reported everything, and I said, uh, I just want to tell you that here's the situation. She says, uh, can I have my paper? Oh, yeah, I said, sure, here it is. I said, you made a zero on it. I said, I'm so sorry. She said, I made a zero? I said, yeah, and I said, you're a good student. You've been doing pretty good, you know. There's only one other test you didn't do too good, but I said, you've been doing really good. And I said, but you have a zero. Well, how did I make a zero? I said, because you cheated. She said, well, there was no one around me. I said, I know, but there was somebody around you in the bathroom. And I said, obviously, it was the bathroom. And I said, I already recorded to the dean. I said, and I said, you get caught again. I said, you want to confess this? I said, if you don't want to, you still get a zero. But I said, if you want to confess it, I said, I won't have to go tell the dean again. And I said, it'll just be added. That's going to be added to your report that you didn't confess it. I said, what do you want to do? Oh, <laughs> she cried. I said, okay. I said, look, I love you and appreciate you, just like I did to that guy. I went and hugged that big football player, man. He could have crushed me in one. <laughs> and so I said, look, man, I love you, man. And I did that to her, too. And. <laughs> But there's cheating that goes on, cheating. And uh, that's why I have to walk around in today, you know, and I'm not, I'm not teaching now and I retire, but because they use their cell phones, I said, to talk to others. So then now I got to watch. They have calculators that look like cell phones. You know what I'm talking about? So I got to, I'm always watching to see, you know, cell phone doesn't, doesn't pop up because they, and if you get caught with a cell phone, it's my cell phone. And for how long do I keep it? I might keep it two or three weeks, you know. Then I'll give it back to them. I said, see me in three weeks, you know, something like that. But, boy, and they try to cheat. You, you, you have no idea what goes on at the, with these students and everything. So one-third of the students in American schools claim to have stolen something last year, like answers to tests. <laughs> They're stealing, you see. Our young people use more drugs in one year. Our students in America use more drugs in one year than any industrial nation in the world. Our students use more drugs in one year than any industrial nation in the world. Our students use 10 times the amount of drugs and alcohol than any other nation, 10 times more than the entire population of Japan alone. Five million teenagers right now in our America are considered to be problem drinkers. 
five million. Send your daughter and your son off to school and do a lot of praying for them and check on them. The National Survey of 23,000 High School Students. A national survey of 23,000 high school students represents the largest of its kind and sheds some light on the ethical considerations of America's youth. Now you know why I'm saying you need to pray for revival. This isn't a message to tell you how bad America is. Oh man, I don't need to start praying for revival. According to a survey in 2010, 59 percent of students admitted they had cheated on an exam in the past year. That's well, 60 percent, you can say. Yeah, I I did cheat on an exam last year. A statistic that dropped to 51 percent from 59 percent, 51 percent in 2012. Two years later, it dropped from 59 to 51. Less cheating. Those who claim to have copied another's homework also dropped from 34 to 32 over the past two years. When it comes to lying to authority, 55% admitted lying to a teacher about something significant in the past year, down from 61% in 2010. It went from, uh, well, he went down. Those who lied to their parents also dropped from 80 to 76%. Nearly 40% of students said they sometimes lie to save money, a slight decrease from 2010. The survey also found evidence of a decline in shoplifting. In 2010, 27% of respondents reported that they had stolen something from a store in the past year, a rate that dropped to 20% two years later. The rate was highest among boys. Nearly one quarter of males admitted to shoplifting compared to 17% of girls. The percentage of students stealing from a friend also declined from 17 to 14. Still going on though. 19% 19, 19 versus 10%. Boys were also 6% more likely to steal from parents or relative at 21%. In other words, while mama and my daddy's taking a rest, they go take a few dollars out of the pocket, out of the wallet. They steal from mama in a purse. You see? Overall, 85% of respondents indicated most adults in their life considered set an example when it comes to ethics and character. How many teens are sexually active? Put your seatbelt on. In 2015, how many teens are sexually active? In 2015, 30% of all high school students reported being sexually active. 30%, 3 out of 10. They had sex in the previous three months. 46% of all 12th graders reported being sexually active compared to 16% of 9th grade students. They're already starting in the 9th grade being sexually active, 16%. 46% of all 12th graders, of all 12th graders, I'm fixing to graduate, 46% of all 12th graders say they're sexually active compared to 16% of the ninth grade students today are sexually active as a mean. Over 10 million students this year, this costs the government a lot of money. Doctors make a lot of money on this. Over 10 million students this year will engage in sexual intercourse. 10 million. 7.9 million of those same students will contract STD, sexually transmitted diseases. 7.9 million will contact a sexually transmitted disease. 7.9 million. Divide that by 50. 50 states. Divided by 48 hours. And you see how many students. Man. And the STDs, here's what they're coming up with. Syphilis, genital warts, chlamydia, gonorrhea, AIDS, and herpes. That's today. 3.9 million teenage girls. Listen, to this is shocking. From 11 years to 19. 3.9 million girls in our American schools will get pregnant this year. 
million from 11 years of age to 19 years of age. That's, they're going to school, 11 years old. What grade are you in in the 11th grade? Seventh grade? I mean, uh, in at 11 years old. Sixth, sixth grade. Look at this, having babies. Getting pregnant. 3.9 million teenage girls from 11 years of age to 19 years of old will become pregnant. The generation on our planet today is said to be the most violent, the most disrespectful, the most materialistic, the most lawless generation in the history, history of mankind. Somebody needs to tell them about Jesus. Somebody needs to tell the parents about Jesus. Somebody needs to tell the parents what's going on. Somebody needs to tell the parents how to pray. If you have a son that's on alcohol, sexually active on drugs and everything else, how do you pray, parents? You bind the strong man on him. You can't cast him out. You bind that strong man. When you get up in the morning, you bind that strong man of alcohol. Bind that strong man of drugs. Ask God to send angels to keep those drug dispensers, you know, those that give out the drugs, away from your child. You understand? Tell them. Father, in the name of Jesus, don't let those drug dispensers, those guys, come near my son or my daughter. Let's face it. God is not happy or not satisfied with people coming to a church and after they leave, leaving the same life they had, have ever lived. The word needs to come forth. Let's face it. Some of you in here are going to have to leave this place, perhaps, and dump your lifestyles and line up with the word of God. God knows who you are and what you have to dump. Some of you are going to have to pick up that phone and dump some friends that you should have dumped a long time ago. Do you know someone out there who would fall into that category? Pray for them. Well, you know, brother, I love her. I love him. No, you don't. You love what they do to you, and you love what they do for you. That's what you love. You just love how they satisfy your flesh. Listen, some of you are going to have to lose some relationships. Oh, you look cute. Everything is fine. But you go to a church. Come here and you go there. And you're this involved in the same old sin. You have not repented. Call upon the Lord. Get a change in your life. And he'll show you. Follow the unctions of the Holy Spirit. If you're a child of God, God will not listen to this. If you are a child of God, you're going to begin, as you hear the Word of God and read it, to be trained to hear the unctions of the Holy Spirit. He'll tell you when to pray. All of a sudden, you're cooking your rice, and you say, pray right now for your daughter. Pray right now for your son. The unctions come, and you know, in the name of Jesus, I bind that strong man. I, in the name of Jesus, on my son and my daughter. Lord Jesus, send an angel to get those people away from my son. But boy, I tell you, look, there are angels sitting up there right now. One lady got caught up. I told you this. Maybe a woman got caught up. She went to heaven. And uh, she gets up there, and there are, man, angels just all sitting there with their arms folded like this. She said, what, what are the angels just doing sitting there? The Lord Jesus said, they're waiting for their assignments. Do you know how many angels and myriads and myriads of angels? Myriads, you know what myriads of angels? Myriads means uncountable. That's what myriads means in the Bible. Strong's. King James. Do you know what it means? There are angels out there that y'all better put on a, start putting on assignment. Start surrounding your son, your daughter with an angel. Look, to do warfare. Lord, let them do warfare against the powers of darkness. 
Well, you're going to see some begin to see some changes. Amen. You say, well, I'm, I'm safe. I'm, I'm born again. I got my name tag. Look, it's not once saved, always saved, okay? But that name tag pin on your lapel is not fireproof. You can have a name tag. I'm born again. Wear it. But when you die, it'll burn. And you in it. God doesn't look at the continents of man, but at the what? The heart. Some of you worship the Lord with your lips, but your heart is far from him. Some of you, you're going to leave today like you did many, 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 many days. And you're going to be the same, 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 same. Your religion is what it is, and it's a form of godliness denying the power thereof. You can stay the same, but I'll tell you what. If you have a form of godliness denying the power thereof, you don't have the power, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and I'll tell you what, you are a pawn, uh, very much so. You don't have the power. And you can end up, maybe not now, but you can end up being a pawn of Satan. And he has you manipulated thinking you're going to heaven when you die. Even believing you once saved, always saved. And that's apostasy. That's, that's, that's horrible. Some of you maybe worship the Lord with your lips. But your heart is far from him. Some of you have already determined to remain the same. I know how I came in. And I'm going to leave the same way that I came in today. See, God sees your heart. He doesn't look at the countenance of man. If you submit it to your religion, your own religion cannot save you. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is ready to love you and love you to the death of self. Say amen. He loves you so much. He's not willing that any should perish. Surely not you. Why don't you ask Jesus, where are you going right now? And be honest and wait for an honest answer. Where am I going? And where is the street that you're on right now taking you? The path you are following right now, where is it taking you? And analyze yourself. Because God loves you so much. He's not one that any should perish at all should come to repentance. How really different are you, question, than the teenagers out there on the streets? Did y'all realize that they was that bad with the teenagers in America? I didn't until I started studying this. When's the last time you heard, if you are religious, when's the last time in your religion did you hear a good convicting message about your lifestyle, your flesh, your sin? When's the last time you heard that? And the fact that you are enjoying your sin more than you do God. If you're enjoying your sin more than you do God, you know where you're destined. You're going to hell. You can't stop sinning by yourself. But if you get born again, ask Jesus to come into your heart. He went to the cross. Before he went to the cross, he took on 39 stripes upon his body. And he who never did sin, Jesus, not sin, didn't sin one time, didn't tell one little itty bitty lie in his life. Perfect child. How would you like it if you had a perfect child and you had to give him to die in the electric chair? You know what I mean? Or something like that. You know what I mean? You didn't do anything. That'd be hard for you to do, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, then think about this. There was no electric chairs then. It was crucifixion. Before there was crucifixion, they didn't have, before there was crucifixion, they had impaling. Impaling was not crucifixion. You know what impaling was? They'd take a stick. It had about an inch and a half diameter with a very fine point to go to a fine point. They'd, and it was about three and a half feet long, four feet long. And they'd dig a hole, they put it in there, pack the dirt, and then they would take, it would take four people to hold him and then they'd, take his pants off and they'd press him up his buttock until he'd reached the bottom of the lung. They'd measure the distance from the bottom of the lung, how deep they go. They didn't want him to die right away. They wanted him to suffer. 
Can you imagine Jesus Christ, 30, look at this, nailed hands and feet, cut open his side, water and came out and everything. Can you imagine? And he never did sin. It, it wasn't just a matter of he died for your sins. How do you think? You think the Father enjoyed that? God's not willing that any should perish. He surely wasn't willing that his son should perish. No, he did it. He wasn't willing, but he did it. But we need to thank the Father for what he did. He gave up a perfect child. You know what I mean? To pay the price so that our kids and us could get saved. Isn't that something, though? And then, besides that, before they put him on the cross, they they stretched his body, you know, on his column. I saw that. I told you that. So the skin would stretch. And when they'd hit it with the whip, it would burst open the skin. You know what I'm talking about? And he did that for your sickness. You don't have to be sick. We don't have to be sick. If someone attacks your body, you don't have to keep it. Say amen. amen. By the stripes of Jesus, you heal. Say amen. amen. And you can get saved. Just ask him to come in. Jesus paid that price. He's more than willing. If you, He doesn't look at the confidence of him. He looks at the heart. If you say it and mean it, he'll come to work in you. Amen. 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 Woo. Thank you. And the fact that you... Or enjoying your sin, maybe, more than you do God. You're following a dead God. Trying to keep you for eternity. There's a dead God, Satan. People call him God. That's their God. Listen, they worship Satan. Some people worship Satan. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 31. It is a fearful, frightful to fall into the hands of an angry God. Can you imagine dying and then you fall into this hands, the hands of this angry, loving, loving God. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Man, I cast out devils. I'm going to read that. In Psalm chapter 7, verse 11. God judgeth the righteous and God is angry angry with the wicked every day. Psalm chapter 7 verse 11. Psalm, I read just now Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. Now I'm reading. That was Hebrews 10 31. Now I'm reading Psalm. Hebrews 10 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Psalm chapter 7 verse 11. God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. Listen, and I'm not talking about you getting a bumper sticker, putting it on your car that says, God loves you. I'm not talking about, you know, God loves you. Or a little fish on the trunk of your car and everything. A t-shirt that says, God is loved. Listen, the world out there doesn't care if you love Jesus. It could care less. It doesn't take any sacrifice to say, I love Jesus. But some of you can't even do that and really mean it. The proof is in the pudding with your lifestyle outside the church building. The proof is in the pudding with your lifestyle outside the church building. Outside the church building. Some of you are going to have to make a life change. You know how to do the spiritual warfare for your loved ones now. I told you a little bit about that. Binding the strong man on them and so forth. Listen to the unction of the Holy Spirit as to when to do it. Some of you are going to have to go home to your apartment or to your home and you're going to have to change the hard drive on your computer. Get rid of that pornography. Some of you may have to get the laptop of your child and bring it someplace where you can have a check for pornography and have it deleted. Cell phones, oh yeah, true. You're going to have to yank the Ethernet cable out of your wall and don't give you your adult, your fornicating computer to someone else. If it's yours, burn it. 
Are you ready to do that? Listen, it's cute to dance or make believe you change your lifestyle when, when you leave, you know, or when you dance around the pulpit. Oh, yeah, man, boy, this is great. But God does not look at the countenance of man. He looks at the what? When you leave the place and you're the same. He loves you. I'm talking about being, rea being real. I'm talking about are you tired? Are you sick of tired of being a fake? Are you sick and tired of being a phony? Are you sick and tired of being a fraud? One thing I want to tell you that the devil is out to what? Steal, kill, and to what? Destroy. That is what he's out to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. Just pause a second, okay? Are you going to have opposition? Of course. He'll do everything in his power to fight you, well, the devil will. But when Jesus is being baptized in the River Jordan, when the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Y'all don't know how it was hard for the Father to do that. You know what I'm talking about? He gave perfection. That's all right. When Jesus is being baptized, he said that. Satan said, oh, when he said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, Satan said, he's the one? This is the one. Satan said, this is the one supposed to destroy me? This is the one supposed to stop my head? This is God. This is your son? Satan didn't go to the insignificant people of that day. Satan didn't go to the garbage collectors or the tax collectors or the prostitutes to get Jesus. No, Satan went to the power people. Satan corrupted the church against Jesus, and Satan did an excellent job of doing that. And one night while Jesus was praying, they arrested him. They cooked up a bunch of lies and false charges against Jesus. They handed him over to the Roman government. They accused him of treason, blasphemy. They took him over to the scourging post, a ring on top, and took the rope and tied Jesus' hands and pulled him up to where his skin was tight, tight, tight on his back. As he leaned over, I saw it when I got caught up. And he would split. So the, 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 after they hit, the skin would split wide open. Now, in closing, in what we are doing now is what we are preaching in our pulpits going to bring in revival, is what's going on in America, in our very own city, and what we are preaching. Is that going to bring revival? Revival will. I know what Brownsville did. <laughs> I saw that thing on the last night, you know, that a worship service, I don't know, on, on the God channel. R.W. Shamrock. R.W. Shambach. Remember that? Yeah. yeah. Simon used to listen to him, remember? When she was growing up. Didn't she want that? R.W. Shambach? Wasn't it Shambach? No, but what you're saying is in Seattle, about two years ago, <coughs> our last one, she was Okay, when um, our last one was about two years old, I would listen to Shambach every night, uh, 8 or 8.30, uh, because I got saved at a Shambach revival at the Municipal Auditorium uh, almost 40 years ago. But uh, anyway, you know how little ones, and most of us have had little ones in here, how they don't want to go to sleep at night, usually. You know, they'll try everything to go sleep, not to have to go to bed at night. And so um, she knew that I listened, I guess, even. Well, she kind of put two and two together, that mom would listen to Sham. She might have been three years old. Uh, mom would listen to Shambach every night. So 
one of her ways not to have to go to sleep, she'd say, me shambok, me shambok. You know how they say me, 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 me at around three, two and a half or three. So that's probably what you're thinking of. I'm the one that would listen to Shambach, but she wanted to listen with me. Well, mainly because she didn't want to go to bed. That's not true. She really wanted to hear what Shambach had to <laughs> Amen. Go ahead. Me, me, me at that age. And um, he was three years old, and he was playing football with the little uh, boy next door. And he comes in, and he, and he says, Mama, me thank me broke me leg. Oh, yeah, I remember that. You know, and that's how they talk when they're around that age. It's right. me, 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 me. Yeah. And we have to be careful that we not me, me, me. Yeah, that's right. You know, we have to. Yeah. In closing, the last comments, R. Deborah Schambach said this, the reason for what you just heard in these statistics, I'm just, I pulled that out. He didn't say it. I, was just, I just pulled this quote out from Schambach. The reason for this situation in America is because of the preachings that are coming from our puppets. I'm going to add, or because of the preachings that are not coming from our puppets. Okay. Yeah. No, here's what Shambach said. I added, Shambach said, the reason for this condition, this, is because of the preachings that are coming from our puppets. That's the condition of America, the condition of our teenagers. Some of our seeker-friendly churches, I hate seeker-friendly churches, we're going to make y'all feel real good. Oh, we're going to grow up to 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 8,000. Some of our seek, we'll make you feel good. Don't worry. We're not going to talk about sin, sex, or uh, anything like that in the pulpit. We're not going to talk about lying, stealing, fornication, adultery, lesbianism, homosexuality, and all this. Some of our seeker-friendly churches, some, say you can't talk about sin. You can't mention the word religion. I hate religion. Richie Lede says he hates religion. I hate it. It's not a way to reach God. Isn't that right? It's not a way to reach God. You can't mention in a secret friendly church, you can't mention the word religion. You can't mention the D word. Deliverance. Cast out devils as if. You can't cast out devils. I'm not going to name the, the religions I hate that even come out and say, you cannot cast out devils. No such thing, cast out devils. Okay. Don't talk of the and religious, uh, seeker friendly churches. Do not talk about adultery, fornication, or pornography. Listen. I don't want to accept y'all. I'm trying to build my church. You understand? The seeker friendly church. Therefore, I'm not going to talk about it because you might get offended, you know. And besides, I kind of enjoy some of that myself a little bit, maybe. You see? I don't know. But that's a seeker friendly church. I'm going to give you two last statements. Revival is a gift of God given to a broken and obedient people. Revival is a gift of God given to a broken and obedient people. Number two, finally. Revival also is renewed conviction. Revival is also renewed conviction of sin and repentance of sin and repentance. It's a renewed conviction of sin and repentance followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. Followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. Listen, I can tell when I go and minister different places, 
churches. I can tell when people are coming under conviction. And that's good. Conviction is good. Now, they can, you see, conviction is what they're coming under. It's not that they hate the message. They just can't stand the conviction. But you preach this now. When you come under, con- you hate this, man. That's conviction. Ask the Lord. It's not, and they blame the minister, the pastor. You make me feel bad. I don't, I want to run out of here. It's the Holy Ghost. If you mean to do business with God, and you feel bad about this message, I can't believe he gave that kind of statistics and all this kind of thing. He says he hates religion. Just ask the Lord Jesus if that's the Holy Spirit. Because when you feel that way, that's conviction. Oh, I forgot to tell you this last thing. No, the fifth to last thing. Without conviction, you're not going to repent. There's no repentance. Without conviction, there's no repentance. So they don't recognize conviction. These hard, hard, they get on. That's conviction. Without conviction, you have to. To feel what you don't like now in order to let God take it away from you. Say amen. Amen. Father God, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for this evening. Lord, I mean this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you're changing the hearts and lives of people because this message is going to be given out to many, 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 many people, Lord. Many, many people are going to hear this message, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that the fire of God, the fire of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is all over this message. And would you get all the glory. You get all the glory, all the, all the, all the glory, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.